Next up here on Blue Stage, we have Heiko Schilling from TomTom. Tom. Uh, he will talk about technology for the moving world. And I know this is the before lunch session, and I'm sure you will listen to Heiko anyway. The Q&A session will be held on TomTom's Tom booth, so not on Heap Space. So after Heiko finishes with his 25-minute talk, you can head over to TomTom Tom and ask him anything you need anytime during the day. I hope you will be here to the end of the conference. Yes. Great. Okay, Heiko. The floor is yours. Thank you. Cool. Thanks a lot. Hi. So I keep it short and sweet. Uh, let, me, let me start with a question. Uh, and for the question, picture this one. So picture two million drivers, so human or computer drivers. So we're talking self-driving cars as well in the picture. And these drivers driving on 65 million kilometers of roads. So to get uh, goods and people moving wherever they have to go. So every time you order something on Amazon, for instance, that means another car on the road, right? So it needs to get your package to wherever you have to go. So we call this a moving world. Now the question is, how do you make this efficient? So how do you have 2 billion drivers on 65 million kilometers of road driving efficient, meaning less emission, less congestion, and actually you don't want any accidents while this is happening? So this is the problem that we're tackling in TomTom Tom with technology for a moving world. And in the next 25 minutes, I try to explain you as much as I can about the technologies that we're using for that. Uh, the team is sitting there. <laughs> So if you have any questions, you can either ask them or me. Um, and I'm very happy that uh, we are here today at HeapCon uh, with our team from Belgrade office. So I'm Heiko, this is the team, and we are TomTom. Tom. So there's three parts in the presentation. So we start with the why. So why looking at this problem and not anything else, right? So there's a lot of stuff that you can look into, um, a lot of interesting problems, but uh, we choose this one, and I'll explain you why in a minute. Then we have to talk about scale. Obviously, there's a lot of drivers, so you have to think about how to scale up. Whatever technology you use, whatever product you use, you need to reach those 2 billion drivers. So how do you do that? And then we talk about the technology itself in 25 minutes. Okay? So for the why. Every 25 seconds, a person dies on the road. So by the end of this talk, that's 60 people. That's roughly, if I look at the audience, this half of the audience. Right? So by the end of this year, it's 1.3 million people, so which means 20% of population of Serbia. So in five years, a country like Serbia just died on the road in car accidents globally. Additionally, another 50 million actually get injured and disabled in the whole process of moving around in cars and vehicles. The next piece of data, 28% of global warming is actually caused by transport. So that makes it the number one contributor to carbon dioxide. And car and truck transport is a significant portion of that. So we're talking everything transport, but car and truck transport is a significant portion of that. And the last piece of data, $3,000 are actually lost every year by an average driver in New York City. And the same is true for every reasonable sized city, so everything above half a million people. So that's what people are losing, and that's calculated by the time you spend in traffic congestion, so the time where you just sit there and wait, and the time that where your vehicle is actually burning fuel, we're moving nowhere. So that's that. So it's people dying, it's global warming, and it's money lost on the way. So now, imagine a world where you actually have a self, a safe, electrified, autonomous world of driving. And that means a world that, that can be actually free of congestion and free of emission and where there are zero accidents. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. Okay? So now, I said, let's talk about scale. So what I would like to explain a little bit, so somehow you need to address those 2 billion drivers, but you will not find them by just one app. So you need to think about where are these drivers and what are the products and what are the markets, where do you, how do you get to these drivers? So just to remind on the numbers, so it's 2 billion drivers. So we're talking mostly humans. So we're working a lot on self-driving car tech, but uh, realistically, you will see the first driving, self-driving cars in at least 10 years from now. So it's not earlier. Whoever tells you something different, 
that person is saturating a bit, and we have uh, a lot of insights and data that we can tell you and talk to you about that. Um, not in this 25 minutes, but maybe at the booth. Um, so it's 2 billion drivers, 65 million roads. How do you make that efficient? So let's wind back a bit. So how this started. What you see here, this picture, that's the Institute of Electrical Engineering. That's actually the largest association of engineers globally. So it's 100,000 engineers associated with that. That building is in London. Uh, that's just opposite our London office. And if you walk into that building, you see this. So actually what this association did is, amongst many things, is they looked at what were the most impactful engineering innovations in human mankind. And they came up with a list of 100, and they had a number of criteria to do that. And one was actually, did that bring human mankind anywhere forward? Did that have an impact on, on whatever way or form? And if you zoom in, it's actually 100. So it's uh, four rows, and it's 25 uh, uh, columns in this class shelf. And if you look at the left upper corner there, there it is. Older ones of you may have known it. That was the first product we've done. So that was the first scaling up step. Uh, that's the TomTom Tom Satnav. So we sold 100 million, so those are active drivers out there on the road, and that was the first product. So now, if you listen to people like Mark Andresen, anybody knows Mark Andresen? So founder of Netscape, anybody remembers Mapscape? Oh yeah, one, good, <laughs> showing my age here. So uh, he also is now a very, very well-known venture capitalist in the, in the Valley. And uh, one of the interviews he did recently um, with Ela Jill in, a, um, uh, uh, in his latest book, which I can fully recommend, um, uh, he made a statement about startups. So first, having your first product is hard. Even harder, getting to your second product, and this is where most companies actually fail. And then he kept talking on, on how do you get to the second product. So we've been over that step. So we had the first product. So we had the last eight years basically working on the second product. And we came up with a range of, of uh, products actually in the different categories, different industries. And that got us from 100 million to actually 800 million drivers. So we're talking active drivers. So the first one was um, car industry. So obviously, people drive cars. And you want to have um, any, any uh, technology for a moving world, you want to have that built into your car. So we've done that. We have 15 million drivers out there now with the technology driving. And it's quite interesting, actually. Car industry gets a lot of disruption at the moment. So if uh, any of you is working in car industry or automotive industry, it's a good space to be in because there's a lot of stuff moving at the moment, which is quite exciting. The next one is obviously apps. So we have 15 million apps out there. So that's an offline onboard app because you want to have a reliable system so that people can drive wherever they need to go and they have the information. So if you uh, take your favorite QR scanner, so you can actually download or become a free beta user of that, or you can just uh, join us at our booth and uh, get a free beta user of that. Then the next one is partners. So if you, if you take out your iPhone, we're partnering with Apple and the native uh, location tech platform on the iOS, that's us. So if you start Apple Maps or if you start any uh, location API or any app that's uses in location API, that's TomTom. So that's another 550 million users. The next one we have as a partner is Uber. So if you call your Uber, then that's TomTom technology that ensures that actually people get around and they get beyond the, on time and again, uh, efficient as possible. So that's a uh, 1 million drivers, 600 cities, 81 countries. So that's the latest uh, we got from Uber in terms of how they rolled out. And then a completely different market is uh, fleet management. So actually, half of, of the vehicles on the road coming from commercial vehicles, and those are fleet management providers. So there we, man we managed to offer uh, the largest uh, fleet management system in Europe and the number four in globally, and that gets us to another one million drivers, um, or one million vehicles, I should say. And there's a number of drivers behind that to get that operating, and those are vehicles who do 24-7. So if you add all of that up, you're getting to 800 million. So that's the scale we're looking at. So this is, this is the order of magnitude um, of problem we're looking at in a, in a moving world. Now, we talked about why we talked about the scale. And now let's use the remaining 16 minutes to actually uh, talk about the technology or some of the technology that's behind that. So the first one, when you talk about technology, is you have to talk about maps. 
So essentially, you want to send drivers on the road and you want to have some form of processing behind that. And you want to do this in a better way than the human driver can do this. So what you need for that is a digital representation of real world. So that's what we call digital map. So the issue with maps, if you take your standard navigation app, and there's a ton of navigation apps out there now, we call them SD maps or um, single definition maps, is that the GPS system is actually only 20 meters accuracy. So I'm either here, this is what my GPS tells me, or I'm out there on the road. I don't really know, right? So this is 20 meter accuracy. And that's perfectly fine if I just have a, a location or local search app or I have a, a, just a standard navigation app, perfectly fine. It's not okay if you run it in a self-driving car because then it makes a difference whether the car is driving on the road or the car is driving on the sidewalk. Right? So therefore, accuracy is quite important. But let's stay for a moment in navigation. So there's 60,000 different sources how we generate the data that you need to have a global digitized map of the world. So very straightforward one is uh, satellite imagery. That's one of the sources. So where you throw in some image processing and a little bit of machine learning to recognize streets. And then you have an AI running, which basically is recognizing crossings, which become your nodes, and the streets in between are the links. So with that, you generate something which is called a mathematical graph. And that mathematical graph has a number of attributes. So it's a directed network. You got an embedding, so node coordinates. Um, Length, speed, it's a sparse network, which really helps, depending on what algorithms you want to throw at the problem. It's a dynamic thing. Again, think of moving world, because the network is changing every time. So you cannot just capture this map once. You have to recapture it again and again. And i talk to that in a minute. And there's a number of functions that you can actually exploit if you want to run any algorithmic on that. So for instance, it's a hierarchical, there's a hierarchical property, which helps you actually to come up with more efficient algorithms. In terms of numbers, this is a bit outdated. So that was a network of 35 million kilometers. So you're looking at the latest ones, roughly 200 to 300 million nodes and around about 400 to 500 million links. So this is the size that you have to solve on the standard problem. And that's a well-known problem. So everybody these days can do navigation apps. So let's move on. So I already touched on this, having a map Fantastic, great. And there's a lot of startups and companies that tell you, okay, we know how to do a map and we have a map and that's great, right? So the next question immediately should be, how do you keep it up to date? Because the moment you captured the map data, it's already outdated. That's a fact. So if you, if you simplify this in this graph, then you have on the y-axis, you have correctness. On the x-axis, you have time. This is your crown truth. This is reality. And this is how you're digital map is decaying over time. So you actually need some time to process the data and publish it, and that by the time you send it out, it's already outdated. That's an issue. So this is what works for a display map. So if you do local search and you find your POIs and everything, fantastic. This is how it looks like for a navigation map, even worse. So for instance, the difference between OpenStreetMap and any navigable map is that uh, OpenStreetMap absolutely fine and decent for displaying. The moment you want to use it for navigation, you already run into issues around the turn restrictions and traffic flows and stuff like that. What you need for navigation is outdated. And it's absolutely true for an autonomous driving map. So centimeter accuracy is decaying very rapidly. Now, what do you do with that? You need to keep that map up to date. Well, the, the problem is, how long does it take you to process it and how long does it take you to publish it? And when I say publishing, it's either centralized and you stream it to any clients out there. So 800 million clients, you stream that data out there, fine. Or you have any sort of offline map or map management where you have to ensure that uh, any installed map gets updated incrementally. How do you do that? So now, if you can speed up this one here, that will actually push it closer to reality. And that's the trick here. So there's a deeper technology stack behind that. Essentially, what we've done is we developed something which is the closest to Git and mapping data. So think of it as a Git repository for mapping data, not source data or uh, uh, source code. It's Git for mapping data. OK, so that's correctness. So then the traditional sources like satellite imagery and so on, so that's not really helping. So the, the trick here, or one of the tricks to keep this up to date is actually the source data. So if you have eight or 800 million users. So what you get back from them is GPS coordinates and timestamps every second. 
So that's it. No more data. So you cannot uh, uh, identify the person or whatever. You just know there's someone capable of driving there at this moment in time um, uh, and this location. So what you see here is a heat map of one month of data that we're getting into the system. So that's uh, essentially people driving 2 billion kilometers every month. If you break this down, that's 32 times the road network, which means we can rebuild the entire global digital map every month, every day, sorry. Every day, you're getting the data in that you can rebuild it. That gives you the reassurance of everything or indication if everything has changed and, and uh, needs to be modified. Okay? So this is, this is part of an updated process. But still, we're talking navigation map. We haven't touched yet on autonomous driving. So this is still a map which is based on GPS probe data, based on, on any technology that uh, is fine for navigation, meaning 20 meter accuracy. Now, for the navigation map, if you look at urban areas, actually it's not a day, it's 20 minutes. So this is uh, um, um, a speed up video of uh, how we're rebuilding the Berlin city network. So every 20 minutes, Every, every item that you see moving around in here is a, is a car driving, which is connected for one of the technologies that I described, or channels, products. And you see how the map is actually building up. So every 20 minutes, you can rebuild that. So that is already pretty good. OK. Um, let's have a quick look into how those GPS traces look like. So for that, um, you look at typically what's called a space-time diagram. So you have your road kilometers here, you have your time here, every dotted line here is a GPS trace, so every dot is a long coordinate with a timestamp every second, and the color coding tells you how fast that person can drive. And what you see here, if you capture the data like this, you immediately can throw geometry algorithms at that, because you immediately identify geometric patterns in there, like this one here, and what you get from these uh, geometric patterns is actually a jam. So this is how a jam builds up. This is a traffic jam. This is the, something happened here because suddenly everything stopped. It could be an accident or anything else. So this is how you capture traffic data on top of your map data. So there's a lot more that you get out of those GPS traces, which we will not go into this 25 minutes. Now let's move on. Um, Self-driving cars. The key thing is, 20 meter accuracy is not good enough. What you actually need is centimeter accuracy. So how do you do everything what I described on global scale at centimeter accuracy? That's the challenge, and nobody has solved that yet. So what you see here is a picture which took us 16 runs with what is called a mapping van. So that's a van with sensors worth half a million euro so you have LiDAR sensors, or laser sensors in there, radars, uh, digital cameras, everything in there. And you need to try for crossing like this 16 times to actually generate a picture like this. So that would be the input into your self-driving car so that the self-driving car then can orient itself, localize itself, and actually maneuver around this crossing. So it's immediately clear that if it takes that amount of mapping, you need to come up with something significantly better than what you had before with the navigation map. And that's precisely what we're working on at the moment. So we have um, a set of technologies that can solve that without having to cross a crossing 16 times like this. So that gets you into the self-driving world. And essentially, the map is needed because the sensors that you have in the car are not good enough. So for once, the sensors cannot look around the corner. So you need to have that to actually see what's going on at a, at a broader scope around your car. Secondly, sensors are very sensitive against any weather conditions. So if you have rain, sun, everything, you cannot just drive on the sensors that you have on the car. And thirdly, any, any environmental models or any other participants or vehicles around you block the sensor data. So also there, you cannot just rely on sensors. So you need a map like this, and, and that is key to actually bring out uh, self-driving car tech, global scale. Um, and that is the reason. So nobody has a map like this. So we have one million kilometers covered now. So we actually have the largest coverage now. We also have a technology that we're working on that gets this up to date in a very accurate, close to reality fashion. But we know that it will take at global scale 
a number of more years. That is the reason why I'm saying uh, it's unrealistic that you see at scale self-driving cars out there um, uh, within the next 10 years. So all the self-driving car techs that you see out there are actually very dedicated to a certain area, very dedicated to a certain region, closed environment. Okay, so that was on the map side. Let's do a quick uh, run through the actually application stack that's on top there. So when I say application stack, you take as an input a map and you calculate a route and you calculate instructions, you visualize that map, you can search on that map, you can localize on that map. So there's different steps. So basic navigation is what uh, most um, uh, apps do these days, these days. Dynamic is really when you take into account traffic. Uh, electric, obviously, is another stepping stone and autonomous vehicle is another stepping stone. In the remaining five minutes, just run through that. So the input for basic navigation is the map data as described. Every map is using some form of Dijkstra algorithm. So Dijkstra was a Dutch mathematician, so he published his algorithm on this two-pager journal um, uh, back in the 60s. Um, this is him on a, on a workshop that we organized with him uh, short before he died. So that's the, one of the perks when you're getting older, that you have the chance to actually meet guys like him. So that was good. Um, then you have an objective function, which can be fastest route, shortest route, windiest route, what have you. And then you have your full stack and navigation, so routing, guidance, uh, finding your location on the map, which is called map matching, uh, visualizing the map, and searching the map. And then what, uh, what basically the whole industry achieved is that over the past three decades, we got rid of paper maps. So anybody still using paper maps? Wow, two. Congratulations. Tell me the experience. I forgot about it. Good. Dynamic na uh, navigation. This is where most navigation apps already fail. There's actually uh, two, three, maybe four navigation apps that can handle that at that scale. Um, when we talk dynamic maps, so again, you're looking at the probe data. One of the things that you get out of the probe data is a speed profile for every street, which tells you on this axis here is the speed, here's the time where the rush hour happens. So you see at every five minute slot, how fast can I drive historically on this road segment? So that gives you a time expansion in your digital network. Suddenly, you no longer just calculate algorithms on, on a digital global map. You actually have a time expansion on that map. That makes the time itself as an input, which means it's an order of magnitude harder, and you cannot apply any more Dijkstra algorithm. So one of the things we had to come up with is faster routing algorithms. And then the next thing that comes on top of that is that you not just take the snapshot of traffic as is now, you actually predict how the traffic is evolving over time. So it means you have even a probability on top of the time expansion, which makes it another order of magnitude harder. So we've solved that, and that's what you get in the navigation app that I showed, uh, so that you can actually drive around with that. And with that, we can prove that we are 30% faster than any other navigation app. So that's from benchmarking. So we're getting roughly any year 600 benchmarks globally um, from institutions. And they tell us that uh, we find faster routes through traffic, through congestions than others. Good. Electric vehicles, I jump over that. So the key thing for electric vehicles is really EV charging stations. You want to have them booked and you want to have them paid out of your app. So we have that. And you want to have a consumption model which tells you how far can I still drive with the battery load. So that's range anxiety. It's just like your phone. You are excited or you're afraid that it runs out of battery, it stops working. If your car runs out of battery, it simply stops, right? End of story. So that is the barrier or the key barrier to mass entry for electric vehicles. So in software, you need to overcome the range anxiety by very accurately predict how far this car can still drive. So we have that. You also have that in the app. Um, autonomous driving, it's the super precise maps. It's something that I haven't talked about yet, an, an approach how you actually localize your car in 3D that's uh, coming from robotics. Um, you need to also figure out the environmental models or the other participants around you. And very importantly, you need, there's a paradigm shift that you are no longer the driver, you are the passenger. So how you re reassure as a computer driving the car that everything is going to be fine. So that's, that's a significant uh, step to do. So I jump over that. And the last bit, picture that you have electric cars, picture that you have self-driving cars, that we have uh, uh, two billion drivers that, uh, that can actually use that and efficiently uh, run around with it. Now the question is, um, 
what happens when 55,000 uh, uh, people actually want to go to Red Star Stadium? Do we have any partisan fans in the room? Oh, I'm very sorry for you guys. <laughs> but in our office, we have a slight tendency for Red Star. So uh, let's, uh, let's assume that it's partisan against Red Star, right? So when you all want to rush to the stadium. So what happens if you go there? Well, this is what happened to Slobodan and me yesterday. So here's the stadium. Basically, you end up in a traffic jam. And the reason for that is, and this is why I'm saying this is now where the hard problem comes into place. So once you have autonomous driving, everything in place, all the algorithmics that I talked about today is just individually smart. So it's trying for one car to optimize a path through that, but it doesn't take into account what's happened to the other two billion drivers. And this is where it gets really hard. So actually what you're looking for is something which is called collaborative navigation. And this is where you get into um, uh, game theory models, Duckelberg routing, atomic, non-atomic players, and so on. Uh, this is where it gets interesting. So this is a topic for the next five to 10 years, and uh, we started working on that one. But I stop it here. Um, just to sum up, so we started with the why. Actually, what we're after in TomTom Tom is engineering a safe, connected, autonomous world. And what we really want is, some, is a world free of congestion emission, zero accidents. That's the goal. So what we've done so far is we had two steps of scaling. So we scaled to 100, scaled to 800 million, but actually we not need to go to 2 billion. So we need to get smart ideas, smart people to actually help us to solve the remaining 60% of the problem. So we solved 40% of the problem, 60% still to be solved. And the technologies we're using is maps, traffic, navigation, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles. And with that, um, I close. So we are hiring here in Belgrade, so obviously, uh, like all the other companies here as well. Uh, maybe unlike some of the companies, we have all the teams and capabilities here. Some of the products are actually developed here uh, in the team that's sitting over there. So Slobodan and the team can tell you more. This is our booth, and uh, thank you very much.